Good morning. I'll be interested to hear what comes out of this thing on top of my neck. Um, we're going to talk a bit about addiction today. You had some homework, as I recall. One was to go through a couple of readings, uh, an overview of 12-step programs, and also a New England Journal of Medicine article. It's really a, a survey article of pretty much all that's understood about addiction and being older. Um, there's no good euphemism for that, so I'm bound to keep slipping back and forth between uh, geriatrics and simply being old. The other you haven't received yet, and that's to attend an AA or NA meeting. And we'll show you a schedule and give you some directions a little further along. But why that's more workable now than it ever was, I'll discuss. There's an inventory that I'd like you to look over. It's embedded in the PowerPoint set that you are getting. And I'll begin the talk properly. Um, I have no commercial contacts with pharmaceutical or other agencies who might benefit by or suffer from my presentation. No medical students or resident physicians were harmed in the presentation of this talk. I've been known to prescribe medications on occasion. I'm not taking any, although many believe that I should. And finally, I shall warn you if I propose any off-label therapies or medication uses. That may be an unfamiliar phrase to many in the audience. Essentially, medications are approved by the FDA for what are called on-label use, or that is what their specific intent is. And when doctors purport to use them in a different manner, that is authorized or permissible, but it is something about which you need to make individual notifications, and certainly which you have to acknowledge in presentations such as this. Phew, what a start. Why don't I begin with the definition of addiction, at least as it exists for the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It's a treatable, chronic medical disease. Note the emphasis on medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. There's something there that you may not know you are missing, but I'll bet inside of you you suspect is supposed to be there, but isn't. We're going to talk as well about the DSM-5 uh, diagnostic criteria. That is their definition of addiction. That's the American Psychiatric Association's view. But the one that's operative throughout this talk is the one you've just heard. And the thing that seems to be missing when we're talking about repetitive compulsive indulgence in substance or behavior is what the substance is or how frequently we repeat it. It's got, as it happens, this definition and all of the operative definitions that we use in psychiatry or in medicine, little or nothing to do with the amount of a drug or even the type of drug that's being used, and it has little or nothing to do with the frequency of or consumption of the drug. So what it actually is a lot more about is the consequences of the usage. Not so much which brand of beer bottle occupies the back seat of your Ford Taurus as to the accidents you just got into with a tree as a result of those empty bottles in the back seat. I'll give you a good example that comes up with probably many of your grandkids. Dizoxin. It's a medication that we commonly give to children with severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's administered in tablet form for convenience. There are other ways to give it, but that's the most common way. And it is really significantly protective against development of stimulant use disorder in later life. By stimulant use, I mean cocaine or uh, amphetamines. Uh, it has another name, by the way, which is methamphetamine. So it's a prescribable medication. You, f you hear about methamphetamine in the context of misuse and of dependence or addiction. But seldom does, do folks tend to think of it as a highly employable therapeutic medication when used in very low doses. My expectation is that when any of us have our final myocardial infarction, that we will want morphine to be available, even though it is potentially a substance that can be used to the point of dependence. So if it isn't about the specific substance, how are we going to tell what the illness state is? If we can't just point at that and say, ah, that causes addiction, well, how are we going to recognize this phantasm of addiction? Behaviorally is the first step. 
you're going to get a history and physical exam. And the quality of behavior, the, the way somebody operates in their external milieu or with the people they contact, helps determine whether somebody has an addiction. We do have laboratory studies. They're fairly primitive and they have a limited range of utility, but we do have them. And we, in fact, identify consequences of the illness. Remember the Ford Taurus banging into the tree? Well, hepatitis, fractures, pancreatic and esophageal cancers, cardiomyopathic heart failure. These are all indications of the consequences of certain substances of misuse. This will be one of your homework items. The Michigan Alcoholism Screening Test, as it happens, is a 24-item inventory of your behaviors. You'll go through this and it will be irritating and annoying in parts because there will be some that you check off yes to. Please don't be disturbed by that. <laughs> Most everybody who takes this test has a couple of items there that they need to check off. But it's a good way of looking from the outside in on what your behaviors are and how they may correlate with those that we identify with or in association with substance use disorders. The yellow portion there, forgive me, I have to accommodate my lack of accommodation here. The ones in yellow are, in fact, a little more doubtful. I mean, you're troubled or you find that a little controversial when you take this test. Have you ever attended a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Suddenly gets you two points towards being alcohol dependent. This is an older test, and it occurred before a time when we actually encourage people to go see what AA or NA is about. All my medical students have to go to an AA meeting or an NA meeting, and I would like you to be considering that. So obviously, by being directed to go do it, or even if it's just from simple curiosity as to what one is, these are big open meetings. They involve no risk. These are the people who don't drink or use. That's an example of where that particular question could be a little perplexing. On the other hand, if somebody gets a couple of points for losing a job because of drinking, that's actually a very insensitive criterion, and it probably ought to have a much higher point value. Most people never let their jobs go until well into their addiction because there's no food bank for alcohol, or no food bank for methamphetamine. So whatever else happens, you will tenaciously hold on to that job to the bitter end. It really requires a lot of incompetence to be fired in spite of your sub or because of your substance use. So those are examples. Um, How we then use this data is to plug it into a grid. I'm speaking of we as people who are in addictions or in addiction psychiatry. We'll take a grid that really lists factors that are predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating, and protective on one axis along the abscissa for folks who remember that part of, um, <laughs> that part of calculus and, and geometry, um, algebra, excuse me, and across the uh, ordinate biologic, psychologic, and social consequences. So we'll take somebody's behaviors, their history, their findings, and we'll plug it into a grid like this so that we can get a picture of the whole person. That's the formulation exercise. That's what stands in the way. This is essentially the psychological MRI or CAT scan uh, that we put a patient through. It clearly doesn't have the objectivity that we might expect out of an MRI, but it is amazingly good in terms of its characterization of stuff that is out to kill us. Who are the people who become our patients? Well, in line with common stereotypes, I'm sorry to say, folks who are really at risk, as you'll see if you can read this, this chart, at the top of the chart are the folks in accommodations and food services. Essentially, the people who are in the back of the, of the restaurant, in the kitchen, or the people who are, in fact, in service industry, working really long hours at relatively low pay and finding that there is a functional advantage to using methamphetamine periodically or a functional advantage to taking alcohol when you get home so exhausted that you can't fall asleep. These are starting points. And the other place where if you happen to be an addicted to a substance that you can go for a relatively easy connection is construction sites. Again, arduous work, long hours, better pay, but at the same time uh, with, with use of certain medications or chemicals it tends to be a little easier to get by. So they tend to occupy the far end of the spectrum of usage. When I asked who are our patients, we generally have an image of them. They are antisocial folks who have facial tattoos and uh, ride motorcycles and 
cause a lot of hate and discontent. So I've put a photograph of what would be a stereotypic example of this. Here, I don't know if any of you will recognize Dr. Oliver Sacks. <laughs> Dr. Sachs is famous in the neurologic and psychiatric community for having written some of the most beautiful and elegiac books on, uh, on neurologic disorders in the literature. In fact, he was the uh, author of the text Awakenings that resulted in the Robert De Niro film um, some good many years later about folks who were being provided a medication for Parkinsonism. This is also Oliver Sacks in a somewhat different role, uh, lifting 600 pounds as part of a uh, part of a competition in California. And this was Oliver Sacks with one of his better friends in late life. Robin Williams, as it happens, uh, was a primary actor in that movie Awakenings, uh, along with De Niro, and maintained a friendship and a correspondence with Oliver for many years. Both of these, why I put them up here, as examples of our patients, <clears throat> both of these had significant addictions to uh, stimulants in both cases, and certainly alcohol and stimulants in the case of Robin Williams, which he managed to overcome on several occasions, and which so did Dr. Sachs. So you have before you two examples, of course, of some of them, at least in one case, venerated, and in the other, most admired uh, professionals on the planet up until their unfortunate expiry some years ago. Um, not people that you would characterize as addicts, per se. A word I'd like to get away from, by the way, we try to get away from it with people with diabetes as well, and stop calling them diabetics. People are not their illnesses. Back on this, note too, by the way, just as an amusing sidelight, that Robin's uh, various acting roles commonly involve physicians. So why did I pick the title I did? This is as much about recovery from addiction as it is about addiction, but bear with me for a moment. What potions have a drunk of siren tears distilled from Limbeck's foul as hell within, applying fears to hopes and hopes to fears, still losing when I saw myself to win? What wretched errors hath my heart committed whilst it hath thought itself so blessed, never. How have mine eyes out of their spheres been fitted in the distraction of this mad madding fever? How benefit of ill? Now I find true that better is by evil still made better and ruined love when it is built anew grows fairer than at first, more strong, far greater. So I return rebuked to my content and gain ills by thrice more than I have spent. may seem a little bit of an obscure reach on my part, but humor me because recovery in addictions as an important concept is on a continuum with the actual expression of the addictions. What is he talking about? Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. But first I want to introduce you to my nephew, Nalu, to try and demonstrate how important perception is in the understanding of this illness and how many different perceptions there are. Nalu at this point is approximately 10 years old, and unfortunately for him, a little bit on the short side. This is a fairly familiar icon to you. It's the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. And we are there admiring, or at least inventorying, this massive bronze plaque that's sitting on the first pillar. And on the plaque are all the great makers and shakers who caused the bridge to happen. They are bankers, they are uh, they're engineers, they are architects, they are politicians. These are, these are large men, mostly white, with large bellies and <laughs> cigar-stained fingers. So we're there admiring this, and he looks up at me at exactly the moment that my beloved spouse is taking a picture of us, and says, Uncle Bill... Um, this is all the people who are important in making this bridge. And I go, yes, Nalu, that's true. And he says, Uncle Bill, didn't you tell me that some people died in this? And I said, yes, probably about a dozen. The actual number is 13. His final question at the point she takes this picture is, so Uncle Bill, where's their plaque? So I'm only bringing it up because this is a 10-year-old whose view of the whole situation is considerably in opposition, not so much in opposition to my own, but is simply different from mine. And, and it's how we have to bring ourselves to see people with addictions. And it really isn't all that difficult if you're willing to accept the primary premise that addiction is in fact an illness state and it causes or at least it encourages people to act badly. 
So, if in fact uh, we are to talk about about this illness of addiction in any intelligible way, it's going to be impossible to give an equal attention to all the areas of interest within the audience in front of me. I'm just going to focus on the areas that I suspect are of highest interest to you. Some of you will be interested in how we got to be creatures with the capacity for addiction and what possible evolutionary advantage did it serve to be susceptible to alcoholism. And some of you might want to know how to recognize addiction and how we got smarter about it. Some of you will just want to help a friend or a lover. And I would suspect, given the prevalence of alcoholism, about alcohol dependence alone of 14% in the general population, it's going to be a fair number of people in this audience. Some of you will be interested in the players, the personalities, because you understand that development of the field is not just a series of random occurrences. It's the concerted outcome of many brilliant people, and unfortunately, among them the charlatans, a number of fairly stupid people. But some of you will be sitting there thinking this is a roaring bore and wonder why we don't why we take care of people who won't take care of themselves. That's actually a perfectly legitimate viewpoint, and it needs to be shown respect. Because as I say, my patients, well, I didn't say it, but I'm about to, my patients have a disturbing tendency to piss people off. And they will do it in a variety of settings, whether it happens to be in a hospital or out on a street. And in fact, it's one of the bigger problems in trying to get physicians into medical school or indeed through residency. Because physicians will enter with this idealism that says, I'm going to sacrifice for you. I am going to eat, take my meals out of vending machines and sleep in upright chairs, and I will have no meaningful, intimate relations with another human being for the course of the next four to eight to 12 years. And the exchange for that is that I'm going to sacrifice for you, okay? And I want you to do just two things, Mr. Patient, Madam Patient. Tell the truth and follow instructions. And then they encounter their first person with alcoholism in the emergency room. And what do you think that's characterized by? Well, you're right. The patient doesn't tell the truth, and the patient certainly doesn't cooperate in following the instructions. And so at some point, the physician has to reconcile that with their previous belief that maybe alcoholism was a disease, and they decide, well, the only way to handle this is to say it's just bad behavior, it's not really an illness. I want to come back around to it being an illness. Some of the historical misperceptions are that substances are the cause of addiction, they are not per se, they are a central factor to the maintenance of the addiction. Those who lack willpower, faith, or discipline, or who are innately corrupt will develop addiction. That addiction is cured by getting people withdrawn, detoxifying them. Um, what some of my uh, students call a, a, a wash and spin dry. Addiction can be fixed by dramatic short-term interventions that we go crashing into somebody's living room and confront them with the error of their ways will somehow or another cure addiction. And that addiction should, in fact, be fixed by a cycle of residential long-term treatment. Well, otherwise, why would it cost as much as it does? Psychiatric illnesses are causative of addiction, another misperception. And that disquieting affect, the way one expresses one's feelings and self-conflict are the root causes of addiction. This gets dangerously close to being psychotherapeutic in its language. Finally, and probably most perniciously, that certain cultures, ethnicities, or social groups by their customs or social norms cause addiction. We'd like to believe that legal and other legal mandates are, uh, are, are in fact effective, and indeed they are to some extent effective, depending on the, on the guise in which they are employed. In later age, some of the effects of uh, your being, what's the word, mature, that's the euphemism of the day, uh, on alcoholism or on substance use disorders, that's what SUD stands for, by the way, guys, I keep using that over and over again, is demonstrated by this. The number of us 65 years and over is projected to double to over 98 million by 2060. That's either a lot of political power or it's a lot of competition for resources, depending on whether you see the glasses, you know, half full or half empty. But the share of the population is going to go up to 24% from the present level of 15%. If you just look at Alaska, it's seen a roughly not quite doubling, but a 52% increase in that age population 
just between the 10 years 1999 to 2009. And while it was the top growth rate for any age group in the United States and three and a half times the national growth rate, that still allows an awful lot of growth in all the remaining 49. So as age increases, stressors tend to move from acquiring new roles and responsibilities to giving up old roles and responsibilities. It's a strange way to phrase it, but what you do is, is you, 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 you willingly dispense with a certain amount of your identity in acknowledgement of a diminution in your capacities. That long-winded sentence was another way of saying it, it hurts to have to give up stuff that we were good at. Two investigators did a thorough review of the complicated relationship of retirement to drinking. Those who had a significant drinking pattern prior to retiring increased drinking. That was a pretty reliable finding in their surveys. On the other hand, retirement planning, figuring out how you're going to use the time, impoverished as you may be, has a moderating effect. It diminishes significantly the risk for developing a severe dependence disorder. Late onset drinkers, by the way, are the people who are more likely to begin drinking or increase drinking in response to loss, retirement, or change in health status, more likely to characterize themselves as lonely, more likely to report less life satisfaction. They have an increased amount of free time and a lessening of role responsibility, so that ends up contributing to the substitution of the use of substances for that seemingly otherwise productive behavior that characterized their past. The disorder level, when it does show up, is generally mild and more successfully treated. So there is a purpose to getting older. It actually makes it easier to recover from these kinds of illnesses. There's a better prognosis for recovery, and most of it is, in fact, the most under-recognized population in terms of intervention in my field. They're the ones I should be going after, not just the adolescents, because they have good outcomes. A major source of uh, uh, orientation toward alcohol and drug use disorders is bereavement. And of course, that's become particularly poignant in the current context of the pandemic. The increased longevity of mature adults is such that with men ever topping out at 73, it means I don't have a lot of time left in my bank, uh, and women at 80, bereavement's become a salient issue, less facetiously, with widowhood resulting in survival of 14 years on average for women, beyond the loss of their mate. Um, for women who are mated to other women or men who are mated to other men, we don't actually have the numbers for that, but the likelihood is that they both will mutually reinforce their survival uh, to the degree that they are at similar risk. So the survival is 14 years for women beyond the death of the mate, it's seven years for men. <laughs> So if you go down, women, you really are going to take your husband down with you pretty soon. What is the bereavement? How can that translate in terms of the sort of emotional tone that makes you susceptible to a substance use disorder? I'm falling back on Bill Shakespeare again. Humor me. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. And with old woes, New wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's stateless night and weep afresh love's long since canceled woe and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. The underlying theme about that is that if you were to get through any chronic uh, disorder, chronic repetitive repul uh, compulsive disorder, it's going to involve other people. It's going to, your recovery is going to involve having somebody adjacent to you in this race to safety. These are just two tables that you'll find in the handout that was provided you, the New England Journal of Medicine article. It has a number of illustrations or tables in it, uh, four actually, and the two that I've included here largely to refer to uh, uh, how the criteria for substance use disorders don't or do apply to those among us who happen to be older. 
mature again, if you will. And you find certain variances, like uh, some of the criteria don't actually make as much sense for older people as they do for younger people. I won't go through that in detail. We're going to use younger people as an example in a moment of how present diagnostic criteria don't always work across the board. But if you want to look for problematic substance use signs in the older folks, they are, and among them, are included these. Psychiatric symptoms, insomnia, mood swings, persistent irritability, anxiety, and depression. Physical symptoms, just being, you know, uh, nauseated, having vomiting, poor coordination, tremors. These are not necessarily the outcome of a natural process, particularly not falls, which have a terribly bad outcome for most of us in the room. Physical signs that are unexplained, such as injuries, falls, bruises, malnutrition, evidence of self-neglect, poor hygiene, the cognitive changes that tend to be our greatest fear, confusion and disorientation, memory impairment, daytime drowsiness, impaired reaction time which of course translates into how long that car stays dent-free. Social and behavioral changes, withdrawal from social activities, family discord, premature requests for refills of the prescription medications at my, at my end of the sword. I keep calling this a chronic illness. How do I get away with that? Well, an example of a chronic illness is one for which many of you are taking medications, and that's hyperlipidemia, elevated cholesterol, high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes, arthritis. Nobody argues with these being considered chronic illnesses, okay? And yet when I throw up alcohol problems and substance use disorders, there's usually a certain amount of frowning, a certain amount of, um, of frontal corrugation, if you will, in the audience. And yet, at the same time, nobody would doubt that indeed these are progressive and, as it happens, tending toward relapse states that have every other character of being an illness. In all but substance use disorders, there's an assumption of ongoing lifelong care and monitoring. So, well then, Bill, what's the difference between it and these? Why, why in fact, would there be no assumption of ongoing lifelong care and monitoring? I don't know, but that's what you see when folks become frustrated at their alcohol-dependent relatives or dear ones who go through a treatment center and then get sick again. I will tell you that most of my interactions with people who come in for treatment begins with, now we need to prepare for your relapse. And they look at me with frustration, exasperation, sometimes surprise, and say, my relapse? I, I'm getting well. I came to see you in order to get over this. And I said, yeah, but ethically I need to warn you that you've got a really good chance of relapsing. In fact, that's probably the most predictable outcome of our intervention, is that you'll get well for a time and then you'll get sick again. And so we've got to prepare for when that ha happens. I say, you're bumming me out, doc. I mean, you're supposed to give me some, you know, some positive strokes and some encouragement. I said, yeah, well, let's work on your alcohol use disorder, <laughs> which unfortunately is going to have that prospect in front of it and be ready for it when it comes. Because I'll tell you, the more times you successfully overcome that relapse, the longer the next time is going to be. And we'll get to a point when you are hopefully recovered for the very long run. You would never take somebody with diabetes, hand them a bottle of Lenti insulin, a bunch of syringes and alcohol swabs and some test tapes for their urine and say, now go forth and drink no more um, no more sugared beverages. <laughs> I don't, no, 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 no follow-up needed. I don't need to see you. You've got what you need and there's the medication. And yet that's exactly what we do with substance use disorders. So in chronic illnesses that have a late onset, an unpredictable course, a complex etiology, and for which remissions are the therapeutic benchmark, um, we need to include substance use disorders among them. Treatment is actually behavioral for diabetes, arthritis, and all the rest. You've got to get people to adhere to the strategy for recovery, to the medications, and to monitoring. And that's exactly what we end up doing with substance use disorders. Now, I'm going to fly through this ne next set of slides because it's not as important as the ones at the end. But it's, uh, it's to convince you that, indeed, you are in a mini medical school. So we're going to use some validated criteria for looking at substance use disorders. And this is how the, um, the American Psychiatric Association and how medical schools and residencies in general set out criteria for somebody having a substance use disorder. These criteria must occur within a 12-month period, and there must be two or more of the criteria that you will see before you to have a diagnosis. Substance taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than was intended, 
there is a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control substance use, a great deal of time spent in obtaining, using, and recovering from the effects of the substance, craving or a strong desire to use, recurrent substance use resulting in a bad effects for work, school, or home, continued substance use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems. And before I go on to the next slide with the rest of these criteria, the larger amounts are over a longer period of time than intended. You will recall that the elder pr President Bush at one point said, we're not going to have any more broccoli at state dinners. I am so tired of broccoli. I hate broccoli. The rest of you will have to suffer if you really love broccoli. We're not going to have broccoli. I don't recall that there was a, that there was an expression of outrage from the rest of the community when he chose to do this. But it is a demonstration that quite unlike heroin or methamphetamine, broccoli does not have strong adherence and a lot of impulse towards repetitive uh, compulsive use. So to some extent, what the substance is does matter. But that's an example of the criterion. Broccoli will never be accused of providing a criterion for substance use disorder. So carrying on. Important social, occupational, and recreational activities given up or reduced because of substance use. Recurrent use in physically hazardous circumstances, recurrent use despite your knowing that you've got a problem that is made worse by it, by your having alcoholic hepatitis or cirrhosis. Tolerance, meaning you keep using amount, larger and larger amounts to get wiped out, or a markedly diminished effect when you keep using the same quantity, like, eh, stuff isn't working for me anymore. Withdrawal, meaning either that you have the withdrawal syndrome, uh, the hangover, in the case of alcohol, or you're willing to take a certain substance similar to what you were using, Valium if you were drinking, or more, more drinking, uh, in order to relieve the alcohol symptoms. So that essentially is 11 criteria. If you get two or more of them, then you qualify for either mild, moderate, or severe forms of alcohol use disorder. And that's how we end up describing it. For people just walking around the street who are asking whether or not I am taking in the correct amount of alcohol, whatever that may be, we have this from the National Institute on Alcoholism and Addictive Disorders, or, uh, uh, alcohol abuse is the old name for it, uh, essentially low risk and high risk margins for alcohol intake. You can read those through at your leisure. As the women in this audience should certainly say, with outrage, why is it that I am not allowed to take more than three drinks and that slob in the seat next to me can, in fact, drink four a day or, indeed, 14 per week when I'm only able to have seven? And I will answer, it is not because of any presumption on the part of, of medical authority. It's because, unfortunately, ladies, you get hit harder by alcohol biologically than the guys do. There's a balancing benefit to being a female in this. So when you're regretting the fact that we're saying you'll get hurt more by the alcohol, I want you to keep in mind the following fact. Women, when they in fact go into recovery, generally are far more successful than men are as long as they get past that first month. Men are notorious for their relapses. So the outcome for women is generally better than it is for men. Your Okay, this chart describes who drinks what when. So 7 in 10 adults will drink at the low risk levels, all right? This is the national population. This is from a good authority. 37% drinking at low risk levels. 35% of the national population don't drink at all. Now, they don't necessarily include people who had a bad experience. It's commonly, it's the, you know, two, two practicing Mormons here and, uh, and, and all those folks who couldn't figure out how to get the bottle top off the beer bottle and gave up after a while, all right? Those, they're there. But in the other section, the 28% who drink heavy or at risk levels, it's useful for you to know that if there is a prevalence rate of between 11.5 and 14% for severe alcohol use disorder in this country, where do you think those people live? They live in this part of the diagram, okay? So if, in fact, at some point along the line, they are prevailed upon to stop using, it will not be by the alcohol-producing industry. And this is where I get on my soapbox and begin my rant. But every year we hear this from companies that will remain anonymous but who have uh, pseudonyms like Eagle Distributing Company of Hawaii Incorporated who say at Christmas time, drink, but drink responsibly. 
And I have to tell you, I have never drunk in order to become responsible in my life. So it is certainly not to this portion of the population that they are directing their message. They really hope that doesn't happen because they can't afford to give up what amounts to roughly 80% of the alcohol uh, industry production that is in fact being consumed by that small portion of the population. So summing it up, substance use disorder is organization around getting it, using it, and recovering from the effects of the drug. Dosage and frequency are not the issue, so don't look for that as the measure. Consequences, however, are the issue, and it's marked by adaptation and deterioration. It's a slow-moving, progressive illness. Ambivalence is the dominant psychodynamic. I was a perfectly respectable emergency medicine doctor for many years before I became a psychiatrist. Only when I became a psychiatrist did I begin using such pompous phrases as ambivalence is the dominant psychodynamic. So you'll forgive me for that, but what it really translates is, into is in anybody with an alcohol use disorder's brain, there are two little voices going at it. And one of them is saying, wow, this stuff is great. This is what's worth living for. And then there's this other voice that's saying, you know, this, forgive me, this shit is killing you. And they're yammering at each other like that. Janus, by the way, the being the, uh, the Roman god who faces in both directions, both truth and lies, just in order to drive the, uh, the organizers nuts, I've put in a seemingly irrelevant slide of a Yugoslavian vehicle called a Zundop Janus. Uh, the seats face in both directions. It was very disconcerting to the people who were passengers because they were always watching the, the horizon recede away from them as they sat in the back seat. Uh, it also had a 16 horsepower engine, so it was not long for this world. Okay, on to the substances. The drug classes, this is as much as you're going to need to know about the substances. Alcohol has its analogs in the form of sedative hypnotics like benzodiazepines and barbiturates. One can replace the other when it comes time for either withdrawal or the development of a dependence because they're all pushing the same buttons inside the brain. You don't necessarily want to know what the neurochemical situ is for where, where these buttons are located. Trust me that they interact in such a way as to largely mimic each other. Opioids include a whole variety of derivatives, but also have their own set of buttons, which they press, some of them um, because they resemble endogenous opioid peptides that the brain produces itself. Uh, some of them don't even really look like opium, but in fact are entirely synth synthetic drugs that nonetheless fit the keyhole, just as an aluminum key will work just as well in a given keyhole as a brass key will. Halucinogens, aryl cyclohexylamines, you get to be a 72-year-old physician, you get pretty good at saying words like that. Cannabinoids and various miscellany like betel, kava, and the rest are in a kind of junk category. But the stimulants are largely over, uh, they largely overlap in terms of their effect, not necessarily their duration, and these are mostly cocaine, amphetamines, and a lot of the medications that we use for attention deficit disorder. For people with addiction, it is commonly the case that they run out of what they need and then we fall back on music from my time which uh, begins with if you can't be with the one you love you love the one you're with what are the treatment options and why did I put this mysterious phrase up here why learning theory and aversive conditioning do not seem to apply to alcohol use disorder I'll put up a picture of uh, <laughs> Nalu's brother Kai for a moment here while I take you through very briefly the reason why just say no doesn't work, and even more so, why hangovers don't cure your alcohol use disorder. So you drink alcohol in the evening, presumably, and you get completely liberally toked, but you're very happy. You've gone from the lampshade on the head, dancing on the table stage, to finally getting into your bed as a result of a designated driver somewhere. But you by and large are feeling pretty good. And then two in the morning, you wake up and the walls have closed in. You have a headache from which you think you are going to die, and as time goes on, you are afraid that it won't kill you, okay? Uh, you, you are nauseated. You are in just terrible agony. And at some point along the line, you discover, okay, hair of the dog that bit me. I've been told about that. I'll take a drink. And lo and behold, the symptoms begin to go away. The whole impulse for Bloody Marys, right, <laughs> is to get rid of the hangover. And it does work. It does work, and it works so well that you should not be surprised that, in fact, the hangover didn't cure your drinking because what, 
what was the good thing in that equation, okay? It wasn't stopping drinking. If there is one message that the person with the alcohol use disorder gets, it's that, okay, alcohol cured the hangover. Alcohol, good. <laughs> alcohol is associated with feeling good the night before. If anything, not drinking is bad, okay? Hangovers are not conveniently timed. They teach you to not stop drinking. Similarly, when we use certain medications like antabuse that will cause you to throw up, fall on the floor, lose your blood pressure, develop man monumental headaches and all the rest, when you use it in conjunction with drinking, the problem with that, of course, is that what the person who's in treatment learns is not to stop drinking. They just learn to stop taking the antabuse. So I, I threw up my nephew here in large part because you can see him, yeah, somnolent. That's, I mean, you've all seen your kids in this posture at some point along the line. Astonishing flexibility to these creatures. They, they will just fit into whatever crevice or hole they happen to be temporarily occupying when they fall asleep and emerge from it in, in, in no pain. Anyway, there he is. And what he's discovered is, of course, what most good addicts do is he's found the perfect drug combination for himself. Uh, as it happens, oops, went one too far, uh, cookies and uh, chocolate bars here and milk here. So the mixture of glucose and tryptophan, one augmenting the movement of glucose across the blood-brain barrier produces drowsiness. And that's why milk and cookies work with kids, okay? You essentially are sedating them <laughs> with tryptophan. All right, but would Kai like being called an addict? Absolutely not, nor, nor do I think of him that way. What are the medications that we use? I've mentioned antabuse, which works really by creating an aversive effect and hopefully training you out. It actually has a lot of utility. If you happen to have an alcohol use disorder and you don't want to start drinking on the airplane when you hear the steady rattle and rumble of the drink cart coming up the aisle, then it is really good to have taken this stuff before you got on the plane because you will manage to overcome the impulse much more effectively. Opiate antagonists we use that actually block the effect of opioids in the brain. Um, anticonvulsants, such as trazodone, are weakly validated for managing alcohol use disorder, but may actually diminish some of the, uh, some of the risk, as in having convulsions. Acamprosate is a drug that's been very weakly validated. I wouldn't go out and buy stock in the company. And drugs like ondansetron and topiramate, similarly, there's literature supporting the usefulness of these drugs in diminishing craving and in diminishing some of the, um, some of the uh, long-standing withdrawal effects of alcohol, but not so strong. And unfortunately, we don't yet have the philosopher's stone of management of alcohol use disorder. Antidepressants such as SSRIs, such as Prozac and uh, sertraline, any of the antipsychotics completely unvalidated. Lots and lots of money gets put into these, these classes of drugs without any evident utility. And in management of alcohol use disorder, sedative hypnotics like benzodiazepines are completely contraindicated except in withdrawal. So if you are in an acute withdrawal, yes, we use these to get you out of the withdrawal, particularly when there's a risk of seizure or other adverse effect. But for trying to replace the alcohol with the sedative over time, unfortunately, you'd think that'd be logical, but it's completely contraindicated. All it does is keep the pilot light on underneath the furnace. So what do we do behaviorally? We have stage therapies that use what are called the ASAM criteria, but to be a little less... Um, uh, a, a, a little less focused on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the lingo. They are essentially limited to residential programs, outpatient programs, and the outpatient programs are individual, group, and milieu therapies. So, I, I, I was stymied there for a moment because I was trying to find some way of saying a talk therapy, which. Uh, bothers me as a phrase, but that's essentially what this is. You're essentially using non-medication strategies in a variety of different settings that may be protective, such as residential programs, or may no longer need to be so overtly protective, such as outpatient programs. Then there are community-based mutual recovery programs. These are not professional entities. You don't go and pay a fee. You don't have a paid facilitator. And in fact, there are no promises associated with going to AA, Narcotics Anonymous, or, or um, 
or any of the 12 step programs. But what they take advantage of is the experience of the people who have recovered from this. And they take advantage of proximity. Because if you are trying to enter recovery, nothing works better than to have somebody else who is recovering him or herself by your side through the process, whether it's nicotine, alcohol, methamphetamine, or most anything else. Psychotherapy, why would I want to do psychotherapy on people who can't process information? Because they're, they're loaded. I wouldn't. So it's important to get people off the drug uh, initially. But it is a developmental disorder. It starts generally around age 14 or 15 for most people who have alcoholism or other drug use disorders. And then, of course, it develops a life of its own. There comes a point at which you wake up, you recover, you're 45 years old, and you're going... There was a lot of time there that I didn't get to spend developing the person I wanted to be. How am I going to get back to being the person that I had an ambition of becoming when I was 14? And that's where psychotherapy kicks in. That's where the ability to relate to another person who has a professional skill in, in, in organizing your future actually has utility. Almost towards the end, guys. Uh, two guys I need you to recognize names of uh, for the final exam. I see a little shock registering. No, there's no final exam. Robert Smith, who was, in fact, a physician. He was prosaically a proctologist, but he was supposedly a pretty good uh, anorectal surgeon. Uh, and Bill Wilson, who was a failed stockbroker. Two very unlikely characters got together in a kitchen in Akron, Ohio in 1935 and planned an organization which has been so far the arguably the most successful recovery program uh, in history. Um, from a validated standpoint, may be second to the methadone program, but not important, both very successful. So how can I distinguish between what goes on professionally and what goes on in, say, AA? Well, in, in, in the professional setting, you've got a school bus. This is the, these are the people you're paying money for, right? And you've got a school bus, and it's driven by generally a five-foot-two-inch, um, this is not an ethnic slur, but it's amazing how often it's true, Portuguese female uh, who has a family of ten kids and has learned how to put up with them, and so by professional advantage becomes a school bus driver. And there are all these unruly third graders sitting on the bus. This is the facilitator for the groups and the patient population in the groups. And the bus rolls along, and the kids start throwing balled-up peanut butter sandwiches at each other, and they're yelling and making a ruckus. And finally, Mrs. Gomez pulls the bus off the side of the road and she turns to them and says, for those of you who have your earpieces turned up, turn it down right now. If you kids don't quiet down, we're not going to go anywhere. So at this point, of course, everybody gets very meek. Mrs. Gomez gets off the bus, smokes two unfiltered camel cigarettes, comes back on board the bus, and they drive off. And what she has accomplished in doing is, by force of personality and a lot of experience, safely gotten them to the school, okay, which will be, in our metaphor, recovery. Now, example number, example two is the non-professional setting, Alcoholics Anonymous, or Narcotics Anonymous or for that matter, Al-Anon, which is for families of recovering folks. You've seen in these kids with the little rope walking on, it's the cutest thing in the world, and I really wish that they'd had it when I was a kid, but I'm not even sure they had rope when I was a kid. And so they're walking along the streets, and they're all holding on to these ropes, because it's safe, right? Like they're going to all, they're all under guidance. They got one mind between them, okay? And it's a wonderful way to do things. And so my metaphor is pretty much, this is Kai when he was very, very little, uh, and his very first girlfriend, and she's showing how things are going to be for the rest of your life, Kai. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Notice who's behind and who's in front. So here we have all these kids standing on the side of the side, on the side of the road, on the sidewalk. They're holding hands. They're facing the school to which they want to get. And the one kid, the little redheaded son, grandson, and great-grandson of Irish immigrants, uh, tries to barge out into the traffic to get to the other side. And because they're all holding hands, he doesn't get to do that because they pull him back onto the sidewalk. And so it goes from most impulsive to least impulsive in terms of people trying to get out across the road to the school, but they're all holding hands. And finally, you get down to the one um, ethnically Japanese female who takes piano lessons at Punahou in the afternoon and is wearing a, an A-frame dress, um, very quiet young girl, and she's standing at the end of the line, and she is convinced there's no more traffic coming in 
two miles in either direction. And at that point, she says, okay, let's go. And they all cross the road safely. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's slow, it's methodical, and it requires that there be a kind of group superego that ensures that they all achieve the same goal, getting to recovery safely. Okay. Last anecdote, and then I'll be back off. Uh, and why it's so important for folks to be getting together or for socialization to occur in order to get through recovery. Because we don't have that many good meds, right? That's number one. Once upon a time, Kalani Breedy took a couple of folks, uh, my, my wife and me and several others, over to Kalau Papa. We, were, we had some interest in determining what the needs were at that point professionally and also, frankly, because I wanted to see Kalau Papa. Um, and if for anybody who's been over there, you will discover that it's a tiny little community, a tiny little residual community, far outnumbered by the federal uh, park service people who maintain the place and make it go. And there are about five churches there, okay? For them, <laughs> at the time, we're about 14 residents. And uh, you may ask why. Well, once upon a time, there, of course, were thousands, and people had different creeds, um, probably even more churches. So on a Sunday, while we were there, we discovered that their form of entertainment in the community on Sundays was they all go to each other's churches <laughs> in a kind of round robin. They'll go around from one church to the other. And uh, if there's somebody there to go ahead and give a homily, great. And if not, well, then some lay person will stand up and give one. All of that by way of background for this. There was no room in the tiny little Catholic church when I was there. And I sat outside with this cowboy who had been a resident there since the 40s. Um, and I asked him an incredibly impertinent question. And I said, you know, as I learned more about the colony and the variety of people who were there, I mean, how did you get by? You couldn't have all liked each other. I mean, there must have been folks that you just had wanted to wring their necks. How could you live in this tiny little part of the island, 1,500 to 2,000 of you, <laughs> without strangling one another? And his response, he chewed it over for a little bit, and he said, you know, we didn't all like each other, um, but we all needed each other. And that ultimately is the defining characteristic of a successful recovery community. I think that's about it. There are a bunch of resources at the end of your slide deck, roughly four slides that show uh, substance use disorder related to late life, uh, locations of 12-step meetings, and you actually just go online, determine where there is an open meeting, and nowadays you get to do it online as opposed to actually walking in on an open meeting. About 90% of the meetings are open. You are welcome to attend. You'll see the rules for it at the website, um, and it's understandable if you feel a little bit self-conscious about going. Um, call me up or email me, and I'll take you to a meeting. Some of the resources that are here, academic resources you may choose to turn to, and I you are done with me. Thank you.